in New Guinea's performance queried in Parliament. Vanimo Green MP responds to court decision. And major retailer dropping prices for a good cause. This is the National MTV News with Mary Bartulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Thursday's news. As of this Monday, all accounts of government's territory authorities have been transferred to the Department of Finance. This is under the government's Public Money Management Regularization Act. Among agencies affected is the PNG Forest Authority. In Parliament today, Western Governor Taboy Awiyoto raised a concern on the transfer of accounts to the Department of Finance, with the Governor concerned on the status of landowner royalties within the forestry sector in his province. Under the government's Public Money Management Regularization Act, 90% of all accounts belonging to government's territory authorities and agencies were to be closed with these funds transferred to the Department of Finance. The PMMA came under the spotlight this morning in Parliament with Western Governor Taboy Awi Yoto questioning Finance Minister James Marape on the security of landowner royalties from within the forestry sector. Prior to the PMMA taking effect on Monday this week, the royalties had been parked under the Papua New Guinea Forest Authority. Can the minister confirm or deny that the, that the royalties, the timber royalties have been, and the operational funds have been removed from the custody of the PNC Forest Authority? According to Governor Yoto, the transfer of accounts to the Department of Finance had been met with concerns from landowners within the Western Province. If it is true, can the forest can the forest resource owners in my province and other provinces around the country would want to know what would become of these funds since these royalties are monies rightfully belonging to the people of the resource owners. In response, Finance Minister James Marape assured the governor that the funds would be kept safe. Royalty funds will not be consumed, they will be kept. But we are interested in excess funds sitting there doing nothing to run CEOs and managing directors and directors pet project across this country, Mr. Speaker. According to Minister Marape, the decision to implement the PMMA was in response to the high number of accounts belonging to authorities which were not being properly utilized. Through the PMMA, this would see all funds now channeled through the Department of Finance, with the government also keen to provide more visibility to funding. Have a have a visibility in many of the funds that belong to state-owned entities, including uh, statutory bodies and uh, state-owned enterprises that sit in uh, thousands of accounts in our commercial banks uh, right across the country, Mr. Speaker. For instance, in uh, the National Forestry Authority, over 36 accounts sitting in uh, uh, three commercial banks right across the country. The PMMA also covers industry authorities, including the Mineral Resources Authority for the mining sector and the National Fisheries Authority, among others. We are in the business of knowing what these funds are for and we are in the business of collecting so that classrooms get built, roads get built, hospitals get built. Yeah. Those monies are meant for those purposes instead of collecting interest in banks sitting there doing nothing at the expense of every one of us in this country. Three days after the Supreme Court recommended his dismissal from public office, Vani Green MP Belda Nama has responded. Mr. Nama has accepted the decision but says he will file a judicial review. He says his actions in 2012 were not that of his alone but one born out of a collective decision. An outspoken Nama addressed the media fraternity this afternoon in Port Mosby stating his disappointment in the leadership tribunal's decision. He says the tribunal had not given enough time to review the technical aspects surrounding his actions when he demanded the arrest of the Chief Justice in 2012. And I have instructed them to file a judicial review in which I will raise various serious technical and legal issues that should have been considered by the tribunal in arrive, uh, before arriving at that decision. 
The treatment bench handed down a 39-page judgment of the allegations against the Vanimo Green MP earlier this week. According to NAMA, a collective decision was made during the 2012 political impasse. He maintains that he had not acted alone. I am being penalized for an act arising from collective decisions by the O'Neill NAMA regime, by the, by the O'Neill NAMA faction during the impasse. I didn't make that decision by myself. It was a collective decision. The court has recommended Mr. Nama's dismissal from public office. But Nama says he has plans to urge authorities like the Ombudsman Commission to look into the matter. He says he has enough evidence to fight the case. Think again, because I will not be silenced, suppressed, intimidated. For standing up for the silent majority and the grassroots of this country, I will continue to fight for the love of my country. Jack Lopave, Jr., National MTV News. A customary landowner on the outskirts of Port Mosby is confused as to how his land title is in the hands of another party. Lama Homoka told MTV it has taken 10 years for his clan to register their land through the Department of Lands. He says a businessman is now in possession with a housing estate and oil palm nursery already established. According to Mr. Homoka, the piece of land is near the Duran Farm Housing Project and is collectively about 300 hectares. The matter has been reported to the Land Fraud Office at the Lands Department. All threatening me now, all kissing bulldozers I go inside, all those same this la ground, all Sanapim house, this la house all Sanapim here, money and me no kai kai, me no sabe, who said kissing this la ground money blow me here. Now me papa ground me walk low, safa is tap, now me walk low, hard walk low, lens department, me go come, go come, now I'm 10 years blow me here. Also now me like him, all members, now all prime ministers, you blow must look him this la problem now, you blow must talk talk low, all lens department. You're watching National MTV News. We go for our first break now, but don't go away. We'll be back with more of the day's top stories after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. A major retailer has come on board to support people affected by the recent magnitude 7.5 earthquake. Brian Bell today confirmed a 15% reduction in prices across its entire range for tomorrow only, with profits from tomorrow's sale to go towards quake-affected communities. Brian Bell announced that tomorrow all profits from the day's sale will go towards helping the people affected by the recent magnitude 7.5 earthquake. There will also be a minimum 15% discount on all items across its range. All of the profits tomorrow across our chemicals division, across our trade electrical division and across our home centre division will all go to help uh, aid and support those families that have been you know, adversely affected by the earthquake. 100% PNG owned, Brian Bell Group has been operating for over 60 years. And with its employee base including over 1,200 family members nationwide, it too has felt the impact of the earthquake. Since the devastating event, the retailer has taken time to assess and evaluate the best way it can support affected communities and individuals. Group CEO Cameron McKellar explained that they want to give more than just money. Uh, so there's several things at the end of the day that um, will go to help uh, regenerate and, uh, and those families that have been affected. Things like seeds, uh, hessian bags, hammers, tools, saws, bush knives and the likes. Everything that we feel that uh, is appropriate to sort of help, I guess, get people back on their feet and, uh, and start rebuilding the communities. Brian Bell has partnered with Oil Search Foundation aid teams to identify the critical locations where the community packs are required. At the end of the day, whilst uh, we're coordinating the activities of tomorrow, um, uh, it's actually the, all of our customers and the consumers that will be helping support and raise much needed funds in order to donate those funds to uh, the Relief Appeal. McKellar called on the public to shop at any of its outlets tomorrow 
to show their support for affected communities. Tomorrow's donation will add to funds that will be used to provide community packs. It's great. We really do hope that uh, everyone gets, uh, you, you know, to support this great initiative. And um, and the way you do it is simply come in and buy something, whether it's 10 kina or 1,000 kina, it doesn't matter. It'll all go to help uh, aiding those people that have been most affected by the earthquake. Lilian Soperakinea, National MTV News. A cheque of 10,000 kina was presented to Hela Province Deputy Administrator Eddie Yui in Port Moresby. The artists as musicians and a visual artist recently performed at the Cosmopolitan Club to raise funds for Hela and Southern Highlands provinces. The artists said it was a successful night and they will be happy to host another concert in the future for disaster relief purposes. Of the 30,000 kina the artist raised on Saturday, the money will be split to three areas in Hela and to the Southern Highlands Province. 10,000 kina was given to Hela Province to purchase immediate supplies. We are really, you know, handicapped at this point in time. And now the, the funds that have been available by the Women Blood City there, it's a you know, good news to us and not be of uh, Hela. That money will be properly utilized. And we will reach the better land of Hela to make sure that this farm is received by the very people. The remaining 20,000 kina will be split between the Mendi Command Center and Pimaga Care Center in Kotobu. The artist will be traveling into the disaster areas in the Southern Highlands and Hela Province tomorrow. But the money that we make here for Saturday night and Okara and Mibla Putim go to watch for Hela and Southern Highlands. The artist said the night was successful and a future concert to raise funds for disaster purposes will be considered. For a future plan, like I said, it's looking, it's looking good, but it needs people, not just one, not just one, not just me, not just Biren, not just Jeffrey Figures and everyone here in the artist for a course, but it needs a group of artists to step together to make a difference in the music industry. The only visual artist who painted on the stage while the concert was on said it was an honor for him to be a part of that event. Jeffrey Figure, who painted an image of an old woman in the Hela province who had hugged the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill during his visit to the Hela province soon after the disaster. The painting will be auctioned at a corporate dinner that will be organized soon. As artists, I think, you know, we, we do what enriches our soul. And um, wherever that takes us, we go. These guys were humble enough and open enough to, you know, approach other artists and to unite us artists and as a visual artist to jump into them you know jump on stage with them it was an absolute honor and a privilege stacy yalo national mtv news you're tuned into thursday's news right here on mtv we'll be back with more for you after these messages stay tuned Welcome back to the news. The recent performance of National Airline in New Guinea was raised in Parliament today with ECP Governor Alan Bird asking if there were plans to overhaul the airline's board and management. His questions came on the back of a recent increase in the number of delayed and cancelled flights. In recent months, National Flag Carrier in New Guinea has been under fire from much of the travelling public over constant flight delays and cancellations. Today, this issue was raised in Parliament. ECP Governor Alan Bird asked Public Enterprise Minister William Duma if the government had plans to overhaul the airline's board and management. According to Governor Bird, the recent increase in continued flight cancellations were now unacceptable. If he could look into the serious management issues in New Guinea, because one of the things I've heard is that most of the good workers have left, both engineers and many of them are Papua New Guineans, they've left engineers and pilots. Could the minister assure the travelling public that New Guinea is still a safe airline for us to use? Could the minister look at the board with a view to replacing that board? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Whilst acknowledging the impact of the loss of New Guinea pilots and engineers to other competing airline operators, Public Enterprise Minister William Duma said the airline was doing all it could during these difficult circumstances. Minister Duma also reaffirmed the airline's commitment to safety which he said would not be compromised. 
Uh, the airline, as well as uh, the Prime Minister and myself, we've all, we've all told everyone that regardless of uh, whatever happens, the safety of our passengers are paramount. And New Guinea is one of the few airlines in the world whose safety record is second to none. And we are not going to, under any circumstances, uh, compromise that. According to Minister Duma, with the recent resignation of New Guinea CEO Simon Fu, the shareholder, Kumul Consolidated Holdings, was now in the process of recruiting a new person to head the airline in these difficult times. Uh, Kumul Consolidated Holdings, Mr. Speaker, has been uh, directed by myself to uh, place an ad in the paper uh, uh, requesting uh, those with the appropriate qualifications to apply. So we are looking at someone who understands a uh, very challenging uh, culture uh, like, I mean, in a country like Papua New Guinea. We're looking at uh, employing someone who will be able to help us turn the company around. In addition, Minister Duma said New Guinea would also undergo a thorough review to see how best it could amend its operations to turn the company around. So I uh, asked uh, uh, strategic advisors to uh, go in, uh, give us an objective uh, report uh, on the way this company has been operating and the way forward. So I can uh, uh, tell, uh, uh, inform our good governor as well as the rest of the country that we are not sitting back. We are, we are equally concerned as our governor and uh, and we are in the process of taking the right step. Hopefully they'll remedy the situation and in the next 12 months we'll see a, we'll see a better and efficient airline. The number of businesses owned and operated by women in the Momasa region is very low. This is according to non-state actors team leader Leonie Rakanangu, who said there needs to be more government support from the provincial to district levels. Today, businesswomen from the Momasa region ended the APEC Women's Expo by showcasing their products. The best participant will be given the chance to attend the Policy Partnership and Women in the Economy Forum during the APEC meeting. State Actors Team Leader Leonie Rakanangu, the Momase region has the lowest number of women in business compared to other regions in the country. We are the lowest in the region. We are still at 5%. So that is very negative for the region as a whole. She said there were a lot of women in business who were doing a lot with little support from the government. She said government support should be given from the provincial to the district and local levels to boost women in business in the Momase region. What we need to know is this sector, small, micro, small and medium enterprises, how much money is going to women to support their activities because at the moment there is nothing really going. These women are participants of the APEC Women's Regional Expo. Today they displayed their products ranging from handcrafts to tailoring and catering amongst many other services. Community Development Secretary Anna Solomon said this is an opportunity for women to showcase their products and be part of the APEC meeting. What we hope to gain out of this um, meeting and workshop is we want, want to identify which women we can bring down to Port Mosby during the APEC women's meeting so they can showcase their business. Uh, the Sikopana National NTV News Lady. Turning overseas now, there are new details about FBI raids on the office, home and hotel of President Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen. The president is furious about the raids, which brought new scrutiny on his attorney. Question is, how much illegal hot water could Cohen be in? So you asked me who I was having lunch with. What did you have for lunch? The famous Danny Deutsch. Michael Cohen talks about his lunch, but not his legal problems, as journalists track him through Manhattan. All right, so before you knock each other over, Cohen's dodge comes as CNN is learning that FBI agents who raided Cohen's office and other properties this week were looking for communications that Donald Trump may have had with Cohen related to Trump's infamous Access Hollywood tape. Hello, how are you? Hi. The New York Times reports the FBI was also looking for evidence of whether Cohen tried to prevent damaging information about Trump from being revealed in the run-up to the 2016 election. Former federal prosecutors tell CNN they believe Trump's personal attorney is in a serious legal jam. This is a bizarre situation. You know, if you wrote a script about this, no one would believe it. One key question regards comments by the president last week aboard Air Force One.
Former prosecutors say they don't think Trump's comments on Air Force One precipitated the FBI raid on Cohen. But they say Trump's remarks could complicate the Stormy Daniels case against Cohen. Well, the natural question is then, if the president didn't know about it, uh, did he authorize it some other way, these payments to Stormy Daniels? Um, if he didn't, why were these payments made? So what is, so what Former prosecutors say by conducting that raid, federal investigators must have had significant evidence on Cohen, and he could be a legal target. If they decided they had enough evidence to engage in a, you know, a, very, aggressive, a very aggressive move, that the likelihood that Michael Cohen is going to be charged is high. If Cohen is charged, what do you think he'll be charged with? Most likely, election violations, the payment of money so close to the election to be an influencer of the outcome of that election. The other charges would be bank fraud, wire fraud. Was the bank told the truth of the purpose for obtaining these funds? If the bank was not, if there are misrepresentations, there's potential bank fraud. If Michael Cohen is charged, legal experts say President Trump could be drawn into some legal jeopardy in Cohen's case if investigators find communications or other evidence that Trump knew about the payments to women or other sensitive matters. Cohen has told CNN that he believes in the end it will be found that he did nothing illegal. The White House has not commented for our story. To Australia now and it's a challenging time for many New South Wales farmers after a dry summer, warm weather continuing well into autumn. The outlook is bleak. Only 6% of the state has avoided dry or drought conditions and without heavy rain, more farms are expected to slip into a drought this winter. Hungry times on bigger station between Crookwell and Cowra. Summer rain fell at the wrong time to grow pasture and autumn sowing has had to be postponed. The state and, and us especially are waiting desperately for that, that next shower of rain. The stampede is not surprising given the flock is completely reliant on feed brought in from elsewhere. The daily requirement in this paddock alone is one tonne of barley, so he's grateful there's still water in the dams. I wouldn't consider we're in you know, drought as such. We're definitely you know, on that verge of, you know, risking into that period over the next few weeks. The situation across New South Wales is sobering. 10% of the state is already in drought. A further 20%, including parts of the Southern Tablelands, is heading that way. And 60% is officially on drought watch. There's not a strong chance of getting rid of those dry conditions in the, in the near term. For Tom McGuinness, the uncertainty is business as usual. A fifth generation wool grower, he says he's better prepared than in the past, thanks in part to government low interest loans, which have helped him pay for new equipment. We have the capacity to feed sheep and animals efficiently, you know, economically, without a lot of emotional, you know, stress on our on ourselves as well, which is probably one of the most important things going into these periods. While many farmers sell off livestock, Tom McGuinness is hanging on to all his 25,000 sheep for now. Every 10 weeks he's getting through 300 tonnes of barley. That's costing us about uh, you know, $10,000 a week in grain. Fortunately, prices for commodities like wool, lamb and mutton remain high, giving him greater confidence the outlay is worthwhile. And by confining his flock to smaller paddocks, he's giving the rest of his property the best chance of recovery when the rain finally arrives. Back home now and residents of East Boroko in Port Mosby will now have access to a proper market facility after NCD Governor Paul Spark and Mosby South MP Jessin Chichenko officiated at the groundbreaking ceremony today. The 1.8 million kina facility will be constructed by Phoenix Construction and will include toilets, lights and water taps. The community was challenged to be responsible by keeping the facility safe and clean for everyone's use. There are about seven settlements around the East Boroko Chinatown area where most of these vendors come from to sell their produce. Today, the vendors were very happy as their once informal market will be upgraded to a modern facility. Because Local member Justin Chechenko challenged the vendors and the surrounding community to change their attitude to pave way for more positive developments. 
We have to look after this market properly. You have to change your attitude and especially the chewers as well have to change your attitude and put the betel nut rubbish in the bin. Not can spit in the belt. We have to change your mindset now. If you want a clean and professional and healthy market, you have to take the responsibility yourselves. Governor Powers Parkop said although he was unsure about the request to build the market, he is positive that the people will take ownership of the market. So me, I must market by come up, but me like him, market time him come up. Please, you must use him good, look out him good, him stop clean. Mama, him by look out in you, you can sell him kai kai, you can see money, now you look out in family. The informal market has been facing many problems. Local vendors such as Dockers, who lives around East Boroko to sell her produce, says the construction of the market is timely as it will provide safety to many women who sell at Chinatown. Stacy Yellow, National MTV News. A single mother from Isipi province, Lina Singu, who was among women who showcased their business today during the APEC Regional Women's Expo. Lina has been doing handicraft for more than 40 years. Her products are sold everywhere in the country as well as overseas. She earns almost 30,000 kina a month from her sales overseas. Linda Singu is the lady behind the sales of these famous Wasara Bilas Bilum, Sipik baskets and these crafts. She creates and sells at exhibitions and cultural shows in the country. She earns 150 kina a day from the sales of these baskets alone. I can design him any something or some billum basket, necklace, anything, a dress or full set, blong all costumes, blossing sing or one name, and I design him. Linda extended from a local sales to selling her products overseas. She is the only woman among the local men in East Sipic that sells to international countries. So for send me every order only place him order on me, me can look look low on the fifteen thousand, twenty thousand. In a year once or twice a year, depending on shells long all outside. So this la me kiss me put it down, look look the needs for beginning for middle school. When I'm all little needs, she gonna whatever let me say go can I buy more new blah something I can walk him now. Same business near gross bit too much, but then it's still a level below me. Linda Singu is a single mother of her only son, 29-year-old Eddie Bumalea. Linda is born to a family of artists specialized in doing arts and crafts. The single mother left school after completing grade 6 some years back. She started performing her skills in handcrafts when she was 12 years old. It took her almost 40 years to do this. All young blah blah now, me like him all my skills in this like kind of skills. So some modern crap, I'm one blah big plus something, and me, and me promote him culture blah me blah one one blah one one province now and him all place you me come blah him. Linda's son Eddie believes that a mother has the potential to excel in his skills. Eddie was the reason a mother strived to sustain the daily living when Eddie's father left them 27 years ago. Without. Help blow papa or this like I'm so little something I make him. I'm so little something I'm going to support him life to me. I say low, go all kind of stuff. And now I say I'm look out to me kind of me man penis. I want to something I say kind side blow school now this stuff something I make make me penis and penis now. Now true lot this stuff work blame I'm so. Suppose he got some like I know way and make him go and I'm going to go and me believe I'm this stuff work and by. Linda was one of the entrepreneurs that showcased her products today. Her products were judged to be qualified to showcase during APEC in November. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, Lay. 
We go for a break now, but on the other side, Trukai Sports with some updates from the Commonwealth Games. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. PNG sister weightlifters Dika and Thelma Toa have time and again made their presence felt on many international platforms, bringing home medals for Papua New Guinea. And right behind them, as their number one supporters, are their parents. Thelma was the first of the lifters to take on the platform on day one of the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, followed by her elder sister, Dika. And through both lifts, it was hard to miss the face of a proud father beaming from the stands. This is what the, uh, the end results are. At the age of 10, Dikatoa showed promise for a fruitful career in weightlifting, and that prompted her parents to support her. From the village of Hanwabada to the world stage, the first being the 2000 Sydney Olympics at the age of 16, Dika Toa stamped her name in weightlifting history. A number of successful events followed, including the Glasgow 2014, where she set a new record, the 2015 Pacific Games, where she got gold, and now the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast. And through it all, Dika Toa was able to have three children while maintaining her sporting career, thanks to her parents who took on the role of parenting her children, while she is away most part of the year on training, along with her manager and husband, William Mavara. Her silver lift last week at the Commonwealth Games came with mixed emotions. <laughs> Having set the Commonwealth Games record in 2014, Dika was looking to defend that gold medal. Unfortunately, strong competition from India's Sanjit Kamaka did not allow that. And at the time of a lift, a proud man with his grandchildren, his wife, his other daughter Thelma, and his son-in-law Willy Mavara were the proudest, if not the loudest, at the Karara weightlifting arena. Those tears were tears of joy. Because uh, I think they have made it. They made it, but then uh, uh, it always happens like that. The best comes out and the, the one of the follows. Toa Lo not only has one daughter to be proud of, but two. The younger of the two, Thelma Toa, took the Commonwealth Games platform for the first time last week, and like they have supported Dika from the age of 10, Mr. and Mrs. Lo held their heads high when Thelma took the stage. And for a debutant, Thelma stepped up to the platform, and a few kilos was all that kept her out of bronze medal, landing her in the fourth spot. Thank you very much for the prayers and support throughout these times. That Probably they've been looking forward for us to uh, bring home gold medals, but it just happened. And as a parting message, Toa Lo encouraged every parent to support their daughters. Females coming up and uh, trying to get in into their men's uh, jobs, you know, activities, or even leadership. We want to put our female daughters a woman in the world or in the Pacific come up and try to boost our daughters and mothers to become leaders so that uh, we can be equal. Dinero Strico National MTV Sports. To Netball Now and Tower Insurance has given its support to Netball PNG by providing insurance cover for the PNG Pepes. The insurance covers the team attending the regional World Cup qualifiers from the 17th to the 22nd of this month in Auckland, New Zealand. According to Netball PNG chairperson Julian Lecker, the sponsorship was timely and is grateful for the generosity of Tower Insurance towards the team. The PNG Pepes are ranked second in the Ocean region and 17th in the world. The team departs PNG tomorrow and for a few lead-up matches in Australia and New Zealand before competition begins on the 17th. Countries participating in this in event include Fiji, Samoa, the Cook Islands, Tonga, and of course, Papua New Guinea. And Trukai Industries has also come to the aid of PNG Peppers with a funding of 100,000 kina for the regional World Cup qualifiers. The team, in an interview last week with MTV, said funding would be a challenge but had been in training. Chair of Netball PNG, Julian Lecker, said it had been a crucial couple of weeks where they had been trying to secure funding for the team and she was very grateful that Trukai had come to the rescue. The World Cup qualifiers will be held from the 17th to the 22nd of this month. 
we go for a break now and we'll be back with more of True Crime Sports after these messages. Don't go away. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. PNG Volleyball Federation President Killa Dick says this year will be busy with preparations to host the 2018 National Championships. The event will be one of the biggest, hosting five national championships with an under-21 championship to be hosted in Leh. The event will be used to make selections for the country's team at next year's Pacific Games. This year's National Volleyball Championships will host both indoor and outdoor events. We have uh, five national championships, two volleyball championships and uh, three indoor uh, championships. So uh, beach volleyball, both the uh, juniors as well as the open. We are going to make it open across the board. So uh, those who are interested through the, through the associations will nominate teams. Uh, beach volleyball is uh, two pairs, so uh, they can nominate as many teams as they want to. Uh, being that uh, this pop sport is still trying to get popular. For the first time this year, National Beach Volleyball Championships will also coincide with the Indoor Volleyball Championships with the Under-21 Championships to be hosted in Leh. We also have the Under-21 Indoor Championship and that championship will be played in Leh during the third term holiday. So straight after Indoor and the Beach Volleyball Champs will be going over to Leh for the Under-21 Championship. Outdoor Volleyball Championships will be categorized into junior and open divisions, while beach volleyball will be played in pairs. This year will be the 44th year of uh, PNG Volleyball in history. Uh, and uh, uh, Under-21 Championship was re recently introduced, I think uh, about uh, 10 years ago, so uh, it's fairly new. Uh, beach Volleyball Championship will be introduced this year. We are also trying to uh, introduce the club championship and we have uh, set club championships to be on the Remembrance Weekend. Uh, that will be sometimes in July. Killer added that this year's nationals will be critical as it will be used to make the selection of the squad for next year's Pacific Games. We have some very big preparations this year. Um, some selections were done last year uh, at the national championships and also at the PNG Games and those selections will now be uh, included for this year's uh, national uh, champs. Uh, and we put together a train-on squad. We've been also advised by the PNG Olympic Committee to, to be able to submit uh, certain deadlines and one which the national uh, train-on squad should be submitted next month. May 18 is the timeline for us. Uh, therefore, we will submit those, um, those uh, listing, the train-on squad listing, but at the same time, too, we'll be organizing the champs to also identify some uh, further talents uh, from, from this year's uh, competitions. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. The Rugby League Now and the PRK Gulf ISO team has received financial support from Prima Small Goods. The sponsorship is to help the ISOs in the 2018 Intercity Cup campaign. The ISO secured their first win over the weekend over the 2017 Premier's Lace Next Tigers. Development. I think probably the people of Gulf and uh, government, you know, uh, the, the, govern, the good governor probably seeing that that perspective trying to develop you know promote development through sports the the value of our sponsorship is, is under thousand uh half in kind and half in case uh, we did our first installment of thirty thousand how to develop so sports in some of the rural areas in the gulf province and uh, we hope that uh, where we go uh, we will uh, certainly partner with uh, Prima Goods and all our sponsors to make sure that uh, uh, they are uh, properly promoted in, in those uh, areas that uh, we, are, we, we are going. Once again, four. And uh, I think we are doing some things right there as far as uh, being Getting competitive, the having had a first <laughs> win. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think uh, you have backed the road. The, the right, the right uh, team. Two Aussie rules and the Easy Loan Premiership AFL competition will kick off this weekend with 16 teams participating. The first to play on Saturday are University Tigers, Concept Koboni, Lamana Dockers and Gordon Skokofa. On Sunday, teams will be taking the field that will be taking the field are the Gerka Bombers, Bomana Cats, West Eagles and Gerhu Magpies. The matches will commence at 9am at the Colts Oval in Port Mosby. 
To football now and the Southern Strikers are set to host National Soccer League champions Totti City Dwellers in Port Mosby this weekend. The school soccer team are desperate to register their second win of the season with a game to spare, including four washout matches. After going through 11 rounds of normal competition, Port Mosby-based franchise Southern Strikers FC have registered only one win so far. Whilst demonstrating their willingness to face experienced opponents in highly pressured matches, the school soccer team is faced with another daunting task of hosting the defending champions Totti City FC in Port Mosby this Saturday at the St. John Guy Stadium. Head coach Margaret Aka revealed his side's hunger to win this weekend. Aka said it will be a mountain to climb against Totti City given the club's undefeated record in the competition. However, she added that no mountain is high enough to climb and her side is well prepared for the task ahead. The last two games, including four assault matches of the NSL, is crucial for the strikers. The last time these two sides met was in round eight of the competition and it was the dwellers who were victors, dumping strikers 3-0 in lay. Southern strikers were the better side for most of that fixture but let the game slip into the second half as a fired Totti City, sparred on by the home crowd, surged back to win the game. In the other NSL matches this weekend, Best of PNG United will be looking for a win against struggling Buang FC in Ley, while the match between Medang and FC Momasi at Lai Warden Oval will be a washout due to the recent trouble in the town. FC Morumbi Wawans are on by this weekend. Shane Soroya, National and TV Sports. And the story wraps up Trukai Sports for this evening. We go for a break now. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Trukai Sports. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region. Port Moresby, mostly fine with a chance of evening shower or two, a top of 32. Some showers expected in Daru and Kerma with a top of 32 as well. 32 degrees as well for Alota and Papandeta with a few showers over the next 24 hours. To the Momasi region, rain expected in Wau and Lei. A few showers for Medang and a shower or two for Wiwak and Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine for Lorengau. Afternoon showers expected for Kaviang and Kimbe. A shower or two expected in Buka, Kokopo and Rabao. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. All these major centers can expect a few showers with morning fog. A look at the forecast for small ships. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru to KY Island to Kerma, Yule Island, Hood Point, Samurai Island, and with waters of Samurai Island to Cape Vogel, Finchafen, and waters of New Britain to New Island and Bougainville, seas 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Bay Island, seas 2 to 3 meters. Waters of Finchafen through Vitias and Dampier Strait to CRC to Long Island, seas 2 to 2.5 meters. And waters of Long Island to Medang, Bogia, Wiwak, Aitape, Vanimo to the northern PNG Indonesian border, and with waters of Manus and its western group of islands, sea 0.5 to 1.5 meters. And a look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas. Coral Sea, seas moderate to rough with southwesterly winds at 25 to 34 knots. Solomon Sea, seas moderate to rough with west to northwesterly winds at 20 to 30 knots. Bismarck Sea, seas slight to moderate with northwesterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. And the Pacific Ocean, seas slight to moderate with northeast to northwesterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. 
and to end the news, a recap of our top stories this evening. A New Guinea's performance raised in Parliament. Vanimo Green's Belden Nama speaks three days after court recommends his dismissal from office. And local retailer drops prices for quake relief cause. And that's the new sport and weather for today, Thursday, the 12th of April, 2018. On behalf of the MTV News team, pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>